We have a theme here at Ablaze for the year. History, which is his story. If you're a Christian, that is a born again person who knows God Almighty as your Lord and Savior, that is Jesus, then history is basically his story. And you become a part of history and his story because you have been transformed. And you you know the God of the Bible who has recorded history for us. The world wants to get rid of Jesus in history. That is why God made sure that there were four historians, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, who recorded history for us that is verifiable. And we know them as the Gospels. In this series, we're taking a look at just one of the historians called Mark. Now, Mark is a little different than the others. He begins with the baptism of Jesus by John. Jesus then, in chapter 1 of Mark, goes into a synagogue. And there is a demon-possessed man, somebody who has an evil spirit, and Jesus casts him out. And everybody goes, who is this guy? Nobody has ever done that. And then the evil spirits say, we know who you are. You are the Holy One of God. Biblically speaking, it is the evil spirits who know exactly who Jesus is, God Almighty on earth earth. Jesus casts him out and says, be quiet. I don't want anybody to say, I know who Jesus is because the devil told me that. He wanted the people to hear his message, see him and his miracles, and come to the conclusion he's the Lord and Savior and the Messiah. Jesus goes into Peter's home and heals Peter's mother-in-law. He's so overwhelmed with people who want healing, he goes off to a place of solace where he can be by himself with the Father, teaching us when you're heavily laden, take some time to be with God. And then we learn about prayer from that leper in chapter one who came to Jesus and said, if you will, that's how we, when you make a request of God, it should always be not my will, but your will be done. Now in chapter two of Mark, It is Jesus who wants all of us to know synonyms for who he is. We know Jesus as the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one, Lord. Jesus wants us to know him by these words. You ready? The son of man, meaning flesh and blood. Jesus says, it is the son of man who's among you flesh and blood. And if he's the son of man, flesh and blood, guess what? He's our brother. The second synonym in chapter two that Jesus wants us to know him by is doctor, physician. And if he's the physician, we're the patients who need a doctor. Another synonym, he's the bridegroom. That means we're the bride. And the last one in chapter two, Jesus says, I want you to know that I am the Lord of the Sabbath. That means the day we give back to God, our Sabbath, he is the Lord of the Sabbath. He can give us rest. He serves us this morning. That's called divine service. When he forgives us, he renews us and he strengthens us and he gives us rest physically, and spiritually. All right, we're moving into chapter three now, but before we get started on chapter three, I want to tell you a story. There was a preacher, a pastor, who was known for a phrase, and the phrase was this, it could always be or could always get to be worse. Maybe you've used that phrase on somebody when they complain to you about this or that. And you say, well, you know, it always could be a lot worse. Anybody ever use that phrase? Come on. Okay, thank you. Well, this pastor was known for it. 
He would always say when somebody complained or said something, you know, it could be a lot worse. Well, finally, one day, a member of his church came up to him and said, Pastor, I got you. Mm -hmm. Something happened to me where you can't say it could be a lot worse. And the pastor said, what happened? He says, well, last night I had a dream. And in my dream, I went to hell. He said, Pastor, what could be worse than that? And the pastor thought about it for a moment and said, well, it could be true. <laughs> Not a dream. <laughs> oh, yeah, it could be a lot worse. Well, today, it is Jesus, through the words of Mark, who shares with every one of us today what is the worst thing that could ever happen to you on earth. And nothing could be worse. And at the same time, he shares with us what could be one of the best things that ever happens to us on earth. You ready? You're intrigued? Let's dig into chapter 3 of Mark. And again, Jesus entered the synagogue, and a man was there with a shriveled hand. And they watched him. Who is they? Those who did not like Jesus. Those who did not believe who he was. Those who wanted to see him go down. And they watched Jesus to see whether he would heal him on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him. These Pharisees, these scribes had laws that you couldn't heal somebody on the Sabbath. Now, did that come from God? No. It came from man's laws. The Pharisees had 613 laws, and one of them was you can't heal somebody on the Sabbath. That's not good. Now, if you preserve a life, we'll let you do that. But if somebody has a broken bone and that bone is sticking out, you can't heal it. You can't mend it. You can't set it. Some crazy laws. And they want to accuse Jesus. Verse 3. And Jesus said to the man with the withered hand, Come here. And he said to them, said to the Pharisees, to everybody listening, Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm? Jesus not, does not go back in history. The scripture he appeals to their reason, their God-given mind. Remember Martin Luther? I've said this so many times. He stood up in front of his peers who accused him of heresy. And he said, unless I'm convinced by Scripture or just reason, I will not recant. What Jesus does here is he just appeals to everybody's Reason. Hmm. How does he do it? And he said to them, Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save life or kill? But they were silent. Now, Matthew tells us a little more about this story. They come to him and say, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? According to their law, Pharisees, no. Jesus repeats that question. Is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath? I mean, you're really asking me that? Then he confronts them. He says, if one of your sheep falls into a pit, don't you get them out? The answer is yes, they do. Then he says, is not the human life more important than a sheep's life? And they were silent. Notice what happens. Verse 5, And he looked around at them with anger and grieved at the hardness of heart. Their heart was hard. And said to the man, Stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and his hand was restored. That was something good. He's the physician. He's the doctor. The Pharisees, went out and immediately held counsel with the Herodians against him, how to destroy him. 
Who are the Herodians? Those are the followers of Herod of Antipas who beheaded John the Baptist. Evil people. So the Pharisees now get together with the Herodians on the Sabbath to plot killing Jesus. Now you know why Jesus added and said, they asked, well, is it right to heal somebody on the Sabbath? Jesus says, hey, is it good to harm or to heal or to give life or to kill? He really smacks them in the hardness of their heart because he knew that in their heart, they were planning to kill him. Wow. Reason alone tells you it's good to have healing on the Sabbath. All right. Verse 7. Jesus withdrew with the disciples to the sea, and a great crowd followed from Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem and Indumea and from beyond the Jordan and from around Tyre and Sidon. When the great crowd heard all that he was doing, they came to him. And he told his disciples to have a boat ready for him because of the crowd, lest they crush him. Have you ever heard of a crowd crushing anybody? <laughs> it happens, it seems, every year in our world. Well, think about this. You're not going to see somebody singing. You're not going to see a sports event. You're going to see somebody if you touch him or if he touches you or speaks to you. You're healed. Your child is healed. Your mom, your dad, your brother and sister is healed. They came from all over, Mark tells us, to rush to be touched by him. Verse 10, for he had healed many so that all who had diseases pressed around him to touch him. 11, and whenever the unclean spirits saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, you are the son of God. Remember in chapter one, evil spirits, you are the holy one of God. Now the evil spirits call him the son of God. It's interesting. It is the evil spirits who know exactly who Jesus is. God Almighty on earth, 12. And he strictly ordered them not to make him known. Why would Jesus tell evil spirits to be quiet? Don't make me known. Jesus didn't want anybody to say, yeah, I know who Jesus is. He is the God Almighty. How do you know it? An evil spirit told me. No, he wanted them to look at Jesus, hear his words, faith comes through hearing, see what he's doing, and with reason come to know him as God Almighty. 13, that's what faith is, folks. 13, and he went up on a mountain and called to him those whom he desired, and they came to him, and he appointed 12, whom he also named the apostles, so that they might be with him and he might send them in the future to preach. Number one, share the teaching, the word of God about the kingdom of God, and have authority to cast out demons. Secondary. Verse 16, the appointed, he appointed the 12, Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter. Remember, Jesus said, hey, Peter, you're a little pebble, but it's upon this massive rock, this mountain, I will build the church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. He changed Peter's names. He also changed the names of the brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James, to whom he gave the name uh, Boanerges, the, that is, sons of thunder. Tell you a story. There was this village, Samaritan village, who rejected Jesus because he wasn't Samaritan. He was a Jew. And James and John, Lord, shall we call thunder from heaven to wipe out the village, fire from heaven? And Jesus just shakes his head, no. <laughs> but he called them sons, the Nuke brothers. <laughs> okay, all right. I wish I had time to tell you about each one of these, but I don't. 18, Andrew and Philip and Bartholomew and Matthew, Matthew, a tax collector, and Thomas and James, the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, and Simon the Zealot. What's interesting, you know who a zealot is? 
somebody who goes after anybody who collaborates with the Romans. You know who Matthew was in chapter two when he was called? He collaborated with the Romans as a tax collector. He puts a tax collector and a zealot together in his 12. It even gets worse. And Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. What a motley crew he puts together. Wow, 20. Then he went home to get a little rest, like you go home to get some rest. And the crowd gathered again so that they could not even eat. Imagine being so busy. You don't have time to be alone. You don't have time to eat. And who enters the picture but family? A brother who tries to tell you what to do. <laughs> and when his family heard it, they went out to seize him, for they were saying, he is out of his mind. They saw how busy he was. They saw what he was doing, and they saw he wasn't eating. And they're going, their conclusion, because they really didn't understand what he was doing, so he's out of his mind. You know, when my brother tells me I'm not doing it right, isn't he really saying, you're out of your mind? <laughs> my mind is better than yours. Let me tell you what you should be doing. Don't blame this family. I'm sure they had best intentions. But now there's another group that had worse intentions. 22. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem were saying, who's a scribe? Somebody who knows the Old Testament. Somebody who knows all the prophecies about the Messiah. That when the Messiah come, he must be called the Son of Man. He must be God Almighty on earth and heal people and do miracles that have never been done before. They knew every bit of that scripture. They come and they look at Jesus who's healing, doing good. And they call it bad and evil. 23. Okay, excuse me, 22. And the scribes came down from Jerusalem are saying, he is possessed by Beelzebul. Who's that? A Canaanite Philistine god of evil. And by the prince of demons, the prince of evil spirits, he cast out demons. And he called them to him and said to them in parables. What's a parable? It's an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. What's a parable? It is a story for you to think about. It's a story that does not relate to scripture, but to your own human reason. Basic principle reasoning. Like Martin Luther, unless I'm convinced by scripture, or just reason, Jesus says, let's reason about this. It's not making any sense. And he called them to him and said to them in parables, how can Satan cast out Satan? That's ridiculous. If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. 25, and if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but is coming to an end. Come on, what you're saying doesn't even make sense. And then he brings it home. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man. Then, indeed, he may plunder his house. Who's the strong man in this parable? Satan. Who's the one stronger than Satan and binds Satan? Jesus. What's another synonym for Jesus? the one who plunders Satan's house. He was casting out Satan and demons from people's bodies. He's stronger than Satan. Why? Because he's God Almighty on earth. These scribes saw good and said it's evil. They saw the Son of God incarnate and they said he's Satan. Do you know anybody in your life that has ever looked at good and called it evil? Or evil and says, this is good? Notice what Jesus says. Here's the warning. 
Truly I say to you, all sins will be forgiven, the children of man, and whatever blasphemes they utter. Here it comes, folks. Listen up. The worst thing that could ever happen to you in this life, the worst thing, there's nothing worse than this. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. Do you hear the warning? For they were saying, he has an unclean spirit. Jesus says to the crowd, whatever sin you commit and blasphemes, I'll forgive it. Then speaking to those scribes, those Pharisees, those Herodians who had a hardened heart, who looked at evil and said, it's good. Looked at the son of man and said, it's, he is Satan. And said, listen, if you don't listen to the Holy Spirit, who's inside of you, you may be guilty of an unforgivable sin. They knew the word of God. They saw Jesus in person. They heard his words. They saw him heal a shriveled hand. They saw him heal and cast out demons. And they hardened their heart to the point and saying, evil. Have you ever known somebody who's so mad at God? What has God ever done for me? He's the worst thing that ever happened to me. Ooh. Now, if you're listening to my voice, and you think the worst thing that has ever happened on earth is Jesus. Be careful. If you think God is evil, be very careful. If you're worried about this sin that is committing the unforgivable sin, you will never, ever commit it. It's impossible because you're listening to the Holy Spirit. What is the job of the Holy Spirit? John 16, 8, Jesus said, I give you the Holy Spirit to convict you of sin. I did not start out, we did not start out this morning with a confession of sin. That is an acknowledgement of our sinfulness. But I'm going to ask you now, right here, in front of everybody here, do you know you're going to die someday? If you know that, raise your hand. Please, just raise your hand. Okay. The Bible says you're going to die because you do things wrong. You're a sinner compared to the perfection and holiness of God. And because of your sin, you're going to die. The wages of sin is death. It is Jesus who came. I'm the doctor. I'm the fixer. And if you believe in me and listen to the Holy Spirit who convicts you, you will be saved and forgiven and you'll go to heaven someday. That's good news, folks. But if you reject me, and you say, I'm Satan, and I'm the worst thing in life, then whew, when you die, you won't be forgiven. And you'll go someplace else. That's the worst thing that could ever happen to you, is to reject Jesus and stay in your hardened heart. Now Jesus changes gears and says, let me tell you about one of the best things that could ever happen to you in this life. You ready? 31, and his mother and his brothers came and standing outside, they sent to him and called him. Now the family that said he's out of his mind is described as his mom and brothers and sisters. They come, again, they want to help. Now if anybody here grew up or maybe has a Roman Catholic background, there is a teaching called the forever virginity of Mary, the perpetual virginity of Mary that was set down by the Catholic Church by Pope Martin in 553 AD, some 500 years after Jesus. And the teaching is this, Mary before, during, and after the birth of Jesus was a virgin. 
that Mary had no more children, even though the Bible says in Matthew that Joseph did not know Mary physically until after the birth of Jesus, even though again and again we're told about the brothers and sisters of Jesus in Scripture, step brothers and sisters, of course, and we know their names, there is a teaching among some Christians that Mary was always a virgin, that Mary was never a sinner, and Mary was bodily assumed into heaven. I'm here just to share reason and scripture with you, because when you put the two together, it makes sense. Here is the mother and the brothers of Jesus coming to him. 32. I just want you to know what scripture says. 32. 32. And a crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, Your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. Now, Jesus in ministry is always bringing you and I and whoever listens from the physical realm in life to the spiritual. You understand water, right? Your need for water. Jesus says, let me tell you about the living water that I can provide for you. You understand bread, eating Jesus says, that's physical. Let me tell you about spiritual bread, that when you eat this bread, you'll never be hungry again. This living water, you'll never be thirsty again. So Jesus says, listen, you have brothers and sisters physically. You have a mom and a dad. Let me tell you about your spiritual family. Brothers and sisters, moms and dads, who are in the spiritual realm. For many of you, you know exactly who I'm talking about. Whoever brought you to church, whoever shared Jesus Christ with you, maybe it's a brother and sister right here. Let me tell you, I've gone golfing with a physical brother. I've gone golfing with a spiritual brother, okay? And he's tried to tell me what to do too. I just want you to know that right here. <laughs> My spiritual brother. <laughs> So it is Jesus who says, let me tell you the good news, 33. And he answered them, who are my brother, my mother and my brothers? And looking about it, those who sat around him, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. Wow. This is what I want you to do. This is what I want you to leave with this morning. Look around. Just look around. On Sunday morning, here you are. Who are you with? You're with moms, dads, brothers and sisters, uncles and aunts who love Jesus, hopefully. <laughs> okay, I'm saying that. Who see Jesus as the Holy One of God, the Son of God. That means flesh and blood and God Almighty on earth who see Jesus, your brother and sister spiritually, somebody who sees Jesus as the physician, the healer, the bridegroom that makes you the bride, and the Lord of the Sabbath who says, listen, I'll give you rest. I will forgive you. I'll give you grace. And someday, if you listen to my voice and believe in me, I'll take you to heaven. Because right here on Sunday morning is a foretaste of the best thing that literally can happen to you, and that's heaven. You know what heaven's going to be like? We're just surrounded by spiritual brothers and sisters. Some may be physical, and others will not be. Some physical brothers and sisters, moms and dad, may not make it to heaven. But your spiritual brother and sister, moms and dad, will be there. And nothing is greater than this, Jesus calling you his friend, calling you my brother and my sister. Wow, that's good news. Amen.